Thanks, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you. And thank you for joining us for this session today. My name is Amar, and I welcome you on behalf of Sankalp and IntelliCAP. Many of you might have been to Sankalp summits in the past. And while we will likely miss the energy that is quite palpable at Sankalp, we hope that this virtual format will be a good replacement in terms of the outcomes envisaged. And we also hope that we can do this in person the next time around. First of all, I would like to thank Global Affairs Canada and Investing in Women for supporting this session. In this session, we intend to talk a little bit about the evolution of the impact investing landscape in Southeast Asia, delve deeper into how impact investing with a gender lens has evolved, and then focus on uh, the ecosystem in Vietnam uh, in particular a little bit. I would start by introducing the panelists for today in no particular order. We have Andrew Rowell, who is the MEL Director at Investing in Women. We have Shuin Tang, partner at Patamar Capital and CEO at the Beacon Fund. We have Lan Fan, head of exploration at UNDP Vietnam's Accelerator Lab. And we have Dr. Thang, founder and director at the Center for Social Innovation and Entrepreneurship in Vietnam. Thank you once again for, for uh, joining us to all our panelists. We will be presenting some broad findings from our recent work in the region and then invite comments from the panelists. But before we do that, I request Jared Breding, Head of Cooperation at GSE Vietnam to say a few words. Over to you, Jared. Thank you very much, Amar, and uh, welcome to the panelists and the participants. It's great to see uh, entrepreneurs, intermediaries, policymakers, and investors engaging on what we see as a very important issue in Vietnam, namely the impact investing ecosystem. Um, I've been asked to sort of set the scene, uh, and I'd like to do that in, in two ways. One is to talk very briefly about the global ecosystem, uh, and in particular, the government of Canada's engagement in that ecosystem. And then two, speak to uh, Vietnam specifically, the ecosystem here, as well as government of Canada engagement. So let me start with the big picture. Um, at the global level, I mean, the government of Canada really sees um, 2015 as a really key milestone for us and the international community, largely uh, the introduction of the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, the 17 very ambitious goals that seek to address the most pressing development challenges of our day uh, and really provide an action plan for how to address those development challenges. Um, the bad news, however, uh, with respect to that milestone or watershed moment is the financing gap associated with achieving those sustainable development goals, which the UN estimates at about two and a half trillion US dollars a year globally. And that's a trend that no doubt is growing in light of uh, the COVID pandemic and the economic impacts uh, that we're facing now and that we continue to expect to face moving forward. This presents a significant challenge. And from the Government of Canada perspective, um, we see the private sector in particular as a critical yet underutilized resource in supporting developing countries in addressing the sustainable development goals. The private sector brings important expertise, important knowledge, innovation capacity, and financial capital to bear on these challenges. The good news is there's quite a momentum globally uh, and regionally for private sector engagement in meeting pressing development challenges, including the impact investing sector, where we see business activities um, that are focused both on financial and on social returns as a key movement, uh, a key trend. Um, and that's largely fueled by consumer demand that we anticipate will continue through time. And so Canada's responded accordingly. Uh, at the global level, we've increased, uh, introduced new institutions, um, FINDEV Canada, which is the Canadian uh, Development Finance Institution, was launched a few years ago. We've also expanded our programming authorities for our international development cooperation, which allows us to partner more seamlessly with the private sector. Uh, it allows us to take uh, debt, equity, and guarantee positions in a way that we couldn't a few years ago. Uh, we're also now in the early stages of working on a private sector engagement strategy, 
And so these are some of the initiatives that the government of Canada has taken in light of both this pressing challenge I've outlined, as well as uh, to, to, to leverage the momentum that's, that's been created globally and regionally. Uh, but what about Vietnam? Um, we're sitting here in the embassy in, in Hanoi, um, and Vietnam largely is a remarkable development success story, as we know. Um, almost unparalleled economic growth over the last couple of decades, uh, incredible um, uh, poverty reduction figures. And Vietnam is now grappling with challenges that uh, we associate with lower middle income countries, including a rapidly evolving financing landscape where we've seen um, uh, the multilateral development banks um, as Vietnam shifted into lower middle income country status, Vietnam's no, labor, no longer able to access concessional capital through the multilateral development banks. Bilateral development partners have started to reduce their footprint uh, in Vietnam. And so quite rightly, Vietnam and the government of Vietnam is looking at the private sector as a means to addressing their financing gap to meeting their national socioeconomic development targets. Uh, and Canada is playing an active role here as well. Um, we're working at the level of businesses themselves, some more supporting small scale businesses to address really tricky issues associated with market access and access to capital to grow their businesses. We're working with intermediaries like accelerators, like incubators, like financial intermediaries, uh, to improve business development service delivery to these small scale businesses. And lastly, we're working uh, at the policy level, supporting enablers, whether those are policy makers or academia or other actors in the ecosystem. But what about impact oriented businesses? This is where um, uh, concepts like gender lens investing, like impact investing, are relatively new to actors in Vietnam, as I'm sure our panelists can attest. Um, what we've seen over the last few years in Vietnam is un counter to this global and regional trend, the, the deal flow associated with impact-oriented deals is actually reducing. Um, in addition, the COVID pandemic has placed considerable strain on social impact businesses which are largely early stage businesses, small businesses who have less resiliency and adaptability to be able to mitigate the impacts of the, uh, of the pandemic. Uh, and so social impact businesses continue to face considerable challenges in Vietnam as we'll no doubt explore uh, through the panel discussions, challenges such as access to financial capital, access to quality talent, so human capital, um, policy incentives, Etc. And so the question that's on my mind and on the mind of my team here in the embassy is what can development partners like Canada do to support this fledgling, fledgling ecosystem? And that's really led to um, a series of activities that we have supported in country, including um, analysis uh, uh, led by IntelliCap uh, in partnership with CSIP to really explore concretely those supply demand and enabling environment constraints to growth in this fledgling sector in Vietnam. So I very much look forward to the discussion um, uh, to hear from uh, what are a, 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 a well-qualified set of panelists. Um, so with that, Amar, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks very much. Look forward to this discussion. Thanks for that, Jared. The impact in this landscape in Southeast Asia has indeed been garnering significant interest over the past few years, including the one in Vietnam. There have been several research studies undertaken by organizations such as the DIN, IDRC, AVPN, ADB, DPAT, and TSE to understand the drivers and challenges to impact investing in the region and to devise interventions to support. We at IntelliCap2 over the last few years have been part of such research. We recently engaged with Investing in Women to quantify the amount of impact capital deployed in, in the region as a follow-up to some earlier work we had undertaken for the Global Impact Investment Network back in 2018. We have also been working with Global Affairs Canada to evaluate how impact investing and GLI can be supported in Vietnam. As Jared mentioned, we are partnering with CSIP in Vietnam for this particular study. CSIP is present with us today, and I would like to thank them for this. Thank you, Amar. Thank you, Jared. 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 Th
these two research efforts have helped us uncover some trends in the region's impact investment landscape. I would like to use the next few minutes to take you through some of these at the wider Southeast Asian level and for Vietnam in particular. I will then request our panelists to share their perspectives on certain aspects of impact investing and GLI. And we will then open the questions, uh, open for questions from the audience. We have a very, we are keen to hear from not just the panelists, but also from all of you in the audience who have been intimately involved with the topic. And I welcome your comments and questions. Anytime you have a comment or a question, please direct it, please direct it to my colleagues, Shrijit Borthakur uh, or Tanvi Deshpande, uh, who are in this chat, and then they will bring it up to me. Um, moving on uh, to the PPT, I'm not sure if it's shared now. Yes, okay, that's great. In terms of numbers, nearly $18 billion in impact capital has been deployed in the region since 2007 through roughly 750 impact deals. Over 90% of the 18 billion was invested in DFIs with private impact investors accounting for only about 1.2 billion. More than 60% of the total capital deployed was in Indonesia, Thailand, and the Philippines. In terms of sectors of impact deals, the financial services sector and the energy sector attracted almost 50% of the impact capital deployed in the region. If we look at just the past three years, which has been the focus of our most recent research, impact investing in the region has in fact accelerated with one third of the total capital deployed over the last 12 years coming only in these last three years. Also, the number of private impact deals have exceeded the number of DFI deals. Although DFI still dominate as expected in terms of the overall capital deployed. As you can see from the graph, Indonesia and Thailand have remained the top two destinations for impact capital. However, Vietnam see, has seen an increased investment activity. This, although I should add, is more, is more to do with the DFIs investing in Vietnam rather than the private impact investors, as Jared suggested. And I'll come to this a little later. The financial services sector still continues to attract impact investing. However, we do see that these investments are now being channeled more towards fintechs rather than MFIs, as was historically the case. There have also been an increasing number of co-investments in which impact investors have partnered with non-impact investors. The average deal size of such impact investments being at about $3 million. There has also been an increasing momentum for gender lens investing in the region. And over half of the GLI deals since, since 2007 have come in the last three years. Indonesia, Philippines, and Vietnam have received much of the GLI capital from private investors, which is not surprising given the exemplary work and support that IW is providing in these countries. Financial services and agriculture sectors have received most of the GLI capital. Within financial services, the GLI capital was deployed towards commercial banking, inclusive finance, and education finance. Within agriculture, the investing companies have been involved in sustainable supply chains and farm to table distribution, as well as organic food products. Over 70% of the deals by private impact investors have been made in enterprises being owned or led by women and most have a ticket size of less than $500,000. And I would love to hear a little bit more about gender lens investing in general, and particular for Vietnam from Shoin uh, presently. Uh, our interactions in the meanwhile with multiple investors, not just gender lens investors, other investors as well, have revealed though that there is an increasing trend or increasing interest at least of integrating gender at a pre-investment stage, as opposed to only tracking it as a secondary metric at the post-investment stage which bodes well for GLI. Indeed, we could identify 38 such deals which have a positive gender impact, although the intent was unintentional or at least unstated. And 40% of these investments were made in businesses providing goods and services to women and girls. There is increasing awareness about the role of impact, impact capital in women's economic empowerment and support provided by entities such as IW and Andy are in building both fund manager and enterprise capacity has been helpful. However, there continues to be only a small number of investors that have an explicitly stated gender lens operating in the region. Women Entrepreneur Focus GLI has benefited from various interventions to, to help women entrepreneurs access finance and reduce their, their reliance on informal sources, access to networks, overcoming cultural and societal barriers, and investment readiness support. All of this information and more is available in the report that we have recently drafted and is available on the website of Investing in Women. I would request my colleague Shrijit to paste the link to this report in the chat box so that everybody can, can uh, access it. Uh, moving on to, to Vietnam in particular, 
about 2.5 billion in impact capital has been deployed in the country since 2007, most of which, as I mentioned earlier, has been DFI capital. Key sectors of investment are financial services, energy, education, retail, manufacturing, and waste management. Non-DFI impact capital or private impact capital, PII, as, as we are calling it, has been rather muted with only a third of the deals coming from private impact investors. GLI has received support though, and we were able to identify 11 deals with a stated gender lens made in the country. And again, we'd love to hear about this from you, Shubham. With this understanding in mind, especially for Vietnam, we have been working with GSE to develop a deeper understanding of the challenges faced by impact capital in the country. And in this process, we have identified five broad areas that interventions can be directed towards. We and, we and our partner CSIP spoke to over 60 stakeholders in Vietnam and the wider region, some of whom are present here today, to identify these five areas, access to finance, enablers and partners, access to information networks and markets, talents and capabilities, and policy and regulations. Essentially, we looked at the ecosystem in Vietnam through these five lenses to identify gaps and come up with interventions in, about how to fill them. Uh, I'm going to go through each of these uh, five aspects uh, very briefly in the next few slides, and then we can move on to the, to the panel discussion. In terms of access to finance, we find that there is a gap in the availability of early stage impact capital, limited understanding of equity capital among social enterprises, and a deprioritization of the market in favor of other markets by regional investors. We have laid out a few high level approaches to address this gap, and we would love to hear from the panelists and the audience about their perspectives on these. These include setting up of a fund dedicated to early stage impact investing, establishment of a structured angel investing process that would channelize capital from domestic and diaspora HNIs, use of blended finance as a risk mitigation measure to catalyze flow of debt to impact enterprises, setting up of a standardized social impact scoring mechanism which will make impact more apparent to investors and channeling tech-focused capital to T4D or technology for development. Coming to the next key area, which is enablers and partners, while there are several organizations that offer business and mentorship support to startups, only a few have a stated impact focus in Vietnam. And their capability to provide tailored support to enterprises is either underdeveloped or untapped. Further, limited support is available to rural and remote SMEs that may have a high potential for impact, but remain undiscovered. These challenges can potentially be addressed by institution of a results-based grants program for ecosystem facilitators, which will help them be financially sustainable. Provision of online support and mentorship programs for greater access, provision of sector-specific skill support and establishment of a centralized information platform for all stakeholders, and especially to foreign investors, which will allow them to substantively source impact deals. Coming to information networks and markets, there exists limited collaboration among stakeholders domestically and internationally when it comes to Vietnam. And there is limited support available to enterprises in accessing markets and relevant networking opportunities. The purpose of social enterprises essentially often gets lost in larger startup convenings, many of which tend to be tech focused. These challenges can, can potentially be addressed by provision of tailored go-to-market support for businesses in partnership with the intermediaries, creation of a shared repository of information and networks for all stakeholders, investors, social enterprises, intermediaries, and indeed the government, a platform essentially that shares news on impact investing, case studies, and regional success stories. Development of graduation journeys for social enterprises, which will set them up for a long-term path to continue to access impact capital can also help. And so will support to impact focused research and events. Another key aspect of the ecosystem is access to talent and capability building among stakeholders. We have heard that there is limited access to passionate talent for social enterprises. Further, social enterprises often struggle to measure and report the impact that they create. Many SMEs, in fact, have a high impact in the local communities that they work in. However, they are not quite aware of impact investing as a source of capital or about how to manage their impact. And when they do, they struggle to find willing investors who value the social impact. These, these challenges can potentially be addressed by establishment of a dedicated job platform for, for the social impact sector, seeding student internship programs to provide talent to social enterprises, providing programmatic technical assistance and capacity building to investors, and evangelizing the concept of impact among SMEs by conducting business and financial trainings to introduce them to impact investing and help them become, become more investor ready. 
and among investors as well who currently might or might not be creating impact coming to policy and regulations to implement some of the solutions to address the issues that i have highlighted so far the role of policy and regulations cannot be overstated there exist limited incentives as of now for social enterprises and there is a lack of clarity about them investors too face red tape and unclear legal processes when channelizing foreign capital into the country with this in mind there is a need to set up a nodal agency to promote and manage impact investing in vietnam which will deal with all things related to policy there is a need to clarify the benefits provided to social impact businesses and provide them with support in terms of accessing markets and investors and there is also a need to streamline policies and practices for inbound and outbound capital as far as gli in vietnam is concerned only a dozen or so deals have been made our research indicates that interventions such as providing targeted capacity building and pre investment ta to women entrepreneurs and gender enabling businesses capacity building of fund managers and intermediaries to enable them to adopt an intentional incorporation of gender in their investment practices and associated advocacy related to gli can help uh, this brings me to the end of uh, my short ppt and i would like now to invite andrew to weigh in on the topic and provide a perspective on how he has seen impact investing in general and gli in particular evolve how we, how iw has supported gli what has worked what hasn't uh, and what are the next steps uh, andrew all right thanks ana um good morning afternoon and evening all um Andrew Roll from Investing in Women and firstly I should provide a brief introduction to Investing in Women or IW uh we're an Australian government program funded under the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade we started in 2016 we're running through to 2023 our goal is to increase intentional impact investment into women owned and women led small and medium enterprises women's SMEs Our focus is on three target countries in Southeast Asia, Indonesia, Vietnam and the Philippines. And so to this end we establish blended finance instruments with selected impact investors to move capital with a gender lens for women's SMEs. And we also develop partnerships with industry networks and strategic intermediaries to promote and normalize gender lens investing principles across the growing impact investing field. just a, a comment on the uh, presentation of the 2020 research report and i think um intelcap colleagues are going to drop the link in the uh, chat box which is great so thanks to intelcap for their work with investing in women on that report and this 2020 update is something of a sequel it, it builds on initial research which is undertaken in 2017 18 where iw previously worked with the global impact investing network and intelcap to produce a landscape report which is really um a landmark for understanding the dynamics of impact investing and GLI in the region based on 10 years of data and that provided an important baseline for future research so we can see how things have changed so in 2020 we commissioned this latest research to update our understanding and to track change and the timing of the research looking at deals in 2017 18 and 19 means we also have the chance to understand some of the in initial impacts perhaps of covid-19 and explore its implications as as the uh, research was undertaken in april may june of this year so drawing on the research and iw's program experience i can offer just a, a few observations and i won't take too long i mean obviously from amar's presentation we can see that the data really does confirm the sense of progress and acceleration in the impact investing market in southeast asia so it's continuing to build in the region uh the capital deployed over the last 3 years is already 60% of the capital deployed in the previous decade so it is building and also plenty of uh co-investment by non-impact investors being leveraged in um as i, I think emma mentioned the data shows that of course dfis are still providing the bulk of impact investing but it has been encouraging seeing the last 3 years private impact investors significantly stepping up their activity the number of deals by private investors in the last 3 years exceeds the number of dfi deals which is a reverse in the trend from the previous decade um it does seem that uh, over 85% of the impact capital deals have been directed to a growing number of startups and SMEs raising capital from PIIs for the first time so there is that uh, group of 
of, of firms coming in as startups. So on Genderlands Investing, the numbers do confirm this is also increasing in pace. So at the headline level, again, there were more GLI deals done in the last three years than in the previous decade, and the amount of capital, $350 million, was over eight times the amount in the previous decade. Um, again, private impact investors accounting for over 85% of the deals by number. Interesting, the median deal size for Genderlands investing deals is about $300,000, about a fifth of the median non-GLI investment by private impact investors. So there's a few factors behind this. For instance, most GLI deals are still happening at an early stage of business and the fund size managed by GLI investors is still relatively low, so people are looking to uh, build that up. From our own experience, investing in women does see plenty of untapped potential in the market trends for investments in women's SMEs or investments that support women in the workplace or as consumers. We're optimistic about the future for gender lens investing as we look back at our work with investors in recent years. So in our first phase, IW partnered with four established impact investors from outside the Southeast Asia region. So under these Capital Plus partnerships, the impact investors used IW support to pilot new approaches or expand existing ones to investing with a gender lens. So these investors have used these opportunities to experiment and to learn. They've implemented gender lens investing strategies, developed gender lens investing tools as part of their investment and due diligence processes. It's also enabled market research studies, which have helped partners to develop an investable GLI pipeline and take an informed approach to risk in new areas. From an impact point of view, they've also focused on improving gender outcomes within their investee companies. So through this work, we've seen partners conclude close to 30 deals, and that's leveraged private sector capital a ratio of 2.3 to 1. Um, but we've also seen partners raising awareness of the impact benefits and the financial benefits of applying a gender lens. And what's been particularly exciting for us is to see some of the scale up of GLI efforts by these partners and the follow up initiatives they've taken on, which includes fundraising for new funds and investments which apply a gender lens. And I'm sure Xu Yen will touch on Patamar's new Beacon Fund with its focus on providing a model which works for women led enterprises. I think there'll be other examples we touch on as well. As Investing in Women looks to evolve our own approach to catalyzing change in the impact investing market, we have been shifting to a more local approach. So over the past year, we've established new partnerships with local partners, angel investors and local funds managers based in our target countries, groups such as the Manila Angel Investors Network, MAIN, the Foundation for Sustainable Society Incorporated in the Philippines, Indonesia Women's Empowerment Fund, and Ascend Ventures Vietnam. So we're looking to take some of the lessons from our work to date to apply with these local actors. And in the COVID context, this strategy is also proving to be opportune given international travel disruptions. With their domestic footprints, we're expecting investment activities for our new partners to start relatively quickly, but we're monitoring the, COVID, the impact of COVID. And hopefully partners with localised operations will have a stronger capability to, to respond and to uh, deploy funds. We have uh, also been involved in uh, ecosystem building activities, but I was asked to keep these remarks short, so I'll leave it here for now, and I'm sure I'm happy to come back later to touch on some of those other points, um, including around our work with the uh, ecosystem and how uh, we've looked to respond to challenges around COVID-19. Thanks, Amar. Yeah, thanks for that, Andrew. And thanks for mentioning lessons from experience of uh, GLI in the region and how IW intends to apply those uh, moving forward. I would just like to request uh, Shuin to come in here uh, and provide her insights from her experience in operation, operationalizing GLI as an investor and how that has shaped uh, GLI in the country in particular, and and talk a little bit about the weekend. Thank you. Hey, thanks. Thank you, Emma, um, and and thank you uh, for for hosting us at at Suncorp uh, this year. Um, so just a little bit of quick background on, on Padma. So we are a regional impact investing firm uh, focused on Southeast Asia. So we run a number of different funds on the Padma platform. 
Um, so we have two funds, Padma One and Padma Two. Um, they are essentially impact venture capital firms for making Series A investments in companies which are having a strong positive impact on low and middle income communities um, in Southeast Asia. Um, we're very proud to partner with Investing in Women, um, as, as Andrew mentioned, on our, you know, on Padma's Investing in Women Fund, um, through which we made uh, six investments, um, early stage investments into women-led businesses um, across, uh, well, in Vietnam, Indonesia, and the Philippines. And as a few folks have mentioned, um, you know, we've most recently launched the Beacon Fund just a couple of months ago, um, which is a dedicated fund, GLI fund, um, focused on, on female entrepreneurs, again, in Vietnam, Indonesia, and the Philippines. Um, and it's taking a little bit of a different approach, right? Um, and, and I might get to that in a little bit. Um, just as a quick kind of personal background, um, so I've been living in, in Vietnam uh, for, for about eight years now, first in Hanoi and now in Ho Chi Minh City. And I've been doing impact investing pretty much for, uh, for, for most of that time in, in, in Vietnam, which I think really has allowed me to see, you know, the development of the ecosystem from, you know, from the very early days uh, until, until now. Um, and I think as many of the, the previous speakers have already commented, um, you know, I think Vietnam and I think Southeast Asia as a region has come an incredible amount, um, you know, incredible way in, in, in a pretty short amount of time. I think, you know, one thing, and I think it showed up in, in Amma's uh, presentation is that, you know, while the absolute number of deals and the deal value is certainly growing, um, the number is, is still relatively small compared to other regions. And I think then also compared to, I mean, you know, not just say compared to Indonesia, but I think then just looking at the regional picture, I'm sorry, the international picture, uh, Vietnam would still look very nascent in early stage. Um, that may create the impression that there's very limited deal flow or limited opportunities for impact investing. And I want to state emphatically that, you know, in our experience, that, that hasn't been true. Um, you know, I think we do see a very strong and active and healthy pipeline for impact deals in, in Vietnam. Um, and I think, you know, maybe one really important thing that, that we've seen in, in our experience is that, you know, there are a large number of companies being formed with, um, you know, with impact, you know, in, in, I guess, all of the classic impact investing sectors, such as, you know, healthcare, education, agriculture, and so forth. Um, but they may not actively, you know, or as actively be positioning themselves as social enterprises, right? Or be actively plugged into um, different, say, social enterprise and impact investing networks. And, and I think sometimes because of that, there's this perception that there's not much going on in kind of the impact space in Vietnam. Um, whereas I think in reality, there's a lot of interesting businesses um, that, that impact investors and, you know, private investors can, can work with. Um, and, you know, with founders who are mission aligned, who are committed to impact, but may not necessarily, I think, you know, be articulating their business model yet in, in terms which I guess we would commonly, you know, define as, as being kind of, you know, a fit for a, for a social enterprise or an impact business. Um, so I think that said, though, I think that there are a number of gaps as um, quite, again, I think that most speakers have commented on. Um, I would definitely agree that there's been a gap around, you know, the early stage capital or very early stage capital. So um, investments of less than $500,000. Um, you know, I think still the classic challenges of, you know, high transaction costs, the cost of due diligence of these businesses um, is, is there. Uh, and, you know, I think that there is a need for, um, I guess, more creative solutions, right, to, to get capital into that very early stage of the investment spectrum. Um, you know, I think the second point here is that, you know, a large amount of capital is still very much targeted at, I guess, more, you know, more scalable and typically tech kind of enterprises, right? Um, and, you know, so essentially, you know, venture capital, private equity style capital, um, you know, I think there is capital which is needed in the market, which can support a broader range of businesses, which may not necessarily have that same exponential growth potential or be, you know, tapping into a billion dollar market like most, um, you know, venture capital and private equity models call for. Um, I think so for us, that was part of the impetus of launching the, the Beacon Fund, our newest gender lens fund. I mean, I think what we saw there was that there was a lot of really interesting, you know, cash flow positive, profitable businesses, which were being, um, you know, run, I think that I guess more, you can think of them more as kind of the SMEs versus the, you know, high tech startups. Yet at the same time, they were really lacking access to finance because they didn't fit into that traditional VC private equity model. They were too big for kind of microfinancing solutions um, and for various reasons found it challenging to access capital for the bank. So I think we do see this um, kind of the, you know, the missing middle that everyone talks about still as being a very, um, I think a, a hole to be filled in, in Vietnam with kind of more creative solutions that, that go beyond just kind of typical venture capital style, style funding. Um, which, I, which I have to admit is a lot of the, the capital in, in the market or impact investing capital and capital in general in the market these days. 
Um, I would also reiterate the points around, you know, talent and network um, and, you know, policy. I, I think there's, there's, you know, there's work to be done, I think, on all fronts by, by the broader ecosystem, I think, to, you know, to, to, to take Vietnam forward. Um, just very briefly, let me touch on, you know, GLI and some aspects of our GLI journey. Um, you know, I, I would agree with the statements that it is still a relatively new concept in, in Vietnam. And I think even when we were introduced to gender lens investing um, through, through investing in women, you know, in a bit more formal way uh, three years ago, uh, we had a lot of learning to do ourselves. And I think since then, we've really been working hard on implementing a gender lens into every aspect of our investment process and the way that we run our firm. Um, you know, I, I think there's maybe still some myth busting, I guess, to be done around um, gender lens investing, I think both in Vietnam as well as Southeast Asia. I think, you know, there's still maybe a preconception that it's just about funding female entrepreneurs, um, whereas actually it's, it's more than that. And I think even if you are focused on funding female entrepreneurs, uh, you know, it's, it's not just about pointing money and counting the number of female entrepreneurs you've invested in, right? But I think about a much deeper understanding of how do you actually um, contribute to women's economic empowerment right through these models. Um, you know, I think there's another interesting kind of preconception in Vietnam that, you know, there's not much need for it because there's already very strong, you know, gender equality and very high workforce participation by women. Um, I think, you know, again, that's a, a little bit of a myth to be busted. I, I think there's, you know, still a lot that can be done by, by different kind of you know, investors and, and companies, um, you know, both impact and not necessarily impact, you know, focused to, to advance, you know, women's economic empowerment. And I think, you know, Investing in Women has put out some great research um, on, on these topics, not just for Vietnam, but for the whole region. Um, I might keep my remarks there or end my remarks there uh, to, yeah, so we can get into a more interactive discussion down the track. Sure. Thanks for that, Shuin. And I will come back to you for a little bit more. But you mentioned a couple of interesting things there that how you have been able to discover some of these enterprises, which are, you know, SMEs who might have, uh, have a positive impact, but they might not fit the traditional uh, uh, sourcing mechanisms of VC investors. And that's, that's quite interesting. And that's where, you know, enablers and partners and networks come in. So with that in mind, I would like to request Land to come in uh, and provide her thoughts on uh, UNDP's experience and how you see UNDP or other intermediaries playing a part to ensure that such businesses as well uh, are able to uh, find their way to capital. Land? All right. Uh, thank you, Amar. Um, and thank you, the organizer, to having me today uh, to talk on behalf of UNDP. Uh, so a bit of, of my personal background, I just joined the UNDP a year and a half ago. Uh, before that, I was working with the um, Ministry of Science and Technology, and I was working in startup policy and innovation policy. So I can talk both uh, on both, um, uh, both fronts. So in terms of uh, UNDP side, in the last few years, uh, UNDP has um, a lot of different initiatives to support the um, social impact businesses. Um, and uh, we help them in terms of capacity building, a bit of seed funding, we very, very, very small funding. Um, and then matchmaking, we do research uh, with different partners and, and here also including CSIE, for example. Um, we also uh, partner with different stakeholders like CSIP to honor best practices in terms of social impact businesses. Um, and um, with that, in the last few years, uh, we, we have a program such as Youth Collab. Uh, this is a program to support sort of the ideation stage uh, of uh, social entrepreneurship. Um, and then we have programs such as um, SDG Challenge, uh, where we support more of the SMEs uh, rather than startups. Um, and they also uh, have a lot of uh, impact uh, in terms of supporting people with disabilities, uh, youth entrepreneurship, uh, ethnic minority women, uh, so on and so forth. Um, so I came in last year um, with the NDP and because of my background in terms of um, startup policy and such. So I, I helped a little bit with sort of restructuring and looking at how to connect all these different initiatives um, within UNDP. Um, and, and we see that a lot of these are quite short, um, short term support, right? So we support them a little bit in terms of like a week long or a month long um, capacity building programs. And we also support them a little bit in terms of matchmaking with um, like partners uh, and, and, and other stakeholders. Uh, however, we see that there's still a gap later on, and this uh, directly relates to uh, what all other speakers have talked about uh, in terms of funding. So we, we, uh, when we look at these um, businesses year by year, we don't yet see them being able to, um, to, to, to get investment, like follow on investment. And we are asking like, why is it the case? You know, like, uh, and, and exactly like, like Shun said, uh, in terms of early stage 
investment landscape is, is still very, very early. And it's very hard for social impact businesses to, to, to get these uh, investments. So what we do in UNDP um, you know, just the last year um, and now is actually to see how we can contribute to that gap. Um, and we just uh, launched um, Impact AIM. This is an initiative um, that work on both sides. So one, uh, we partner with a, uh, an accelerator, a business accelerator uh, in Vietnam together with NDP to create an impact session program. Uh, so this year we partner with Vietnam Silicon Valley Accelerator uh, and we focus on plastic, um, plastic waste reduction. So that's uh, the first accelerator program that we're doing. And we're also trying to support in terms of uh, develop the impact ecosystem here in Vietnam. So we're starting off with uh, a few projects to actually connecting different stakeholders um, and trying to build that network and um, build the foundation to, to push up to uh, policy advocacy. Because other speakers also said, you know, the, the policy for um, the policy landscape for startups is also very young already. When you talk about like impact uh, startup or, or impact ecosystem is even earlier stage. So there's a lot of work to do. Uh, and that's what UNDP uh, is trying to fill in that gap and connect to the whole stakeholders. Yep, that's it. All right. all right, all right. Thanks for that, Lan. I think you have touched upon, you know, access to information and policy and regulation. And I will come back to you a little bit to talk about uh, policy a little later. But in the meanwhile, I think we have talked about access to finance, enablers, access to information. But I would like to hear from Dr. Tang is a little bit about her experience on how talent and cap capacities of social enterprises can be developed. Uh, Dr. Tang, can you elaborate on how uh, you envision higher education institutions playing a part in the impact investment ecosystem? <laughs> So um, for the um, for the educa education and uh, uh, talent development here in Vietnam for impact um, uh, uh, sector, um, actually um, the, the the impact business just you know, we we introduced the concept for three years now in Vietnam. Before that, you know, starting from two thousand eight, we rather use the word about social enterprise, and you know that in uh, in two thousand fourteen that we have the legal definitions of of social enterprise in Vietnam. Uh, so um, the the impact definition is more recent than the social enterprise one uh, here in the country. Um, uh, uh, what I see, uh, I would like also uh, feedback on some of your key findings about the talent and capabilities um, uh, for uh, for impact uh, here in Vietnam, like uh, limited access to good quality talent with uh, passion for social impact. Um, I think uh, this is not only true in Vietnam but everywhere because. Um, uh, I think most of the youngsters, they are still, you know, as, uh, and also I think as it's, it's, you know, like the Asian cultures, we are impacted a lot by the family, you know, influence and, and things. Uh, so, you know, for us uh, and, and youngsters here, uh, the, even they have the social impact as, you know, making social impact as a passion, but the result of that passion converting into the implementation uh, to be a social entrepreneur will be very limited because of the concept, you know, the, the, the families, you know, backgrounds surrounding them don't allow it uh, to do it. Um, I also uh, see, I agree with the high uh, attrition among social entrepreneurs and their workforce because social entrepreneurs, they, they work with, you know, like social mission, why uh, with, you know, moral compass, why it's not easy to fight, you know, uh, the people who share the same values to work for them. And actually, if we have everyone who share the same value and, uh, you know, who are similar uh, in, uh, and, and from our experience, um, in order to, to grow up a, a social business or, or impact business, we, we need to know more background than only the one with social mission. So even with high attrition, uh, but I think um, it's not really a, really a, Oh, you know, a real weakness is very weak uh, issue, uh, you know, uh, 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 weak issues, uh, because one of the characteristics for social enterprise here in Vietnam is that they are very entrepreneurial. Um, they, they, are, they don't you know, rely on charity and donation as, as a key source of funding. Um, and the other two is about limited abilities uh, for business to recognize a major report impact. It's, it's very true here, uh, you know, like, even the biggest social enterprise, the, 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 you know, uh, 20 years old uh, social enterprise, we rarely find their social impact reports uh, published on the website. So 
uh, the same thing with the um, appreciation of impact and in impact investing for more fund managers, uh, because it's it's also true for you know a kind of uh, you know emerging in developing economies where and also we are kind of you know um, uh, um, we have a, a political you know like the 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 this this the systems that makes us um, as we are ch you know, in transition economy, so people rather focus on uh, creating economic um, values for themselves and the family first, and then it's not there in terms of economic development for them and, and also social development for them to think of uh, the making uh, impact. Uh, so actually, um, all these um, all these findings are somewhat um, you know justified. Uh, by the uh, not only the inner motivations by youngsters, but also the cultural economic development uh, background of the country. So uh, uh, here in Vietnam, higher education, we have embedded, uh, you know, like teaching and researching about social uh, enterprise uh, in into uh, you know in research activities for uh, nearly uh, from 2015 up to now. So 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 about uh, five years now. And, uh, and what is really good is uh, since 28, uh, 2018, sorry, uh, we, we have the uh, one national program, which is the uh, promoting uh, entrepreneurship uh, in higher education, where I sit as, as vice uh, deputy, uh, the deputy of the working group. So um, as, as, as the key, you know, kind of um, ecosystem builders and social innovation, so I have, Introduce the the concept of social entrepreneurship as one track of you know startup and entrepreneurship in teaching and researching in higher education see in Vietnam and working with uh, the partners like UNDP and also British Council here in Vietnam we have uh, trained over three hundred trainers you know university lecturers um, on how to teach uh, social entrepreneurship um, in the countries uh, so and um, so British Council here rather work on, um, you know, education sector, uh, education, um, you know, um, and, and awareness raising with the universities. Why UNDP uh, is rather working on incubation accelerations as, as you know, like, ex, you know, like, um, you, know, you know, like as outcomes of the, uh, the awareness raising education incubation in universities um, from, from higher education here. So I rather rather see we even the ecosystem builders here we are uh, uh, very small uh, in terms of numbers um, um, but uh, we work quite uh, in synergies as you know high education and um, uh, international donors and also incubation accelerations program uh, together to um, to build um, the, the the ecosystem for for for, for social enterprise and. Uh, impacts up uh, here in Vietnam. So yeah, got it, got it. Thanks for that, Dr. Tan. I think I think you brought up an important point that there is a need to make some long-term interventions and promoting entrepreneurship in higher education and social entrepreneurship uh, in general as well. But there is definitely this need to bring in more collaboration between universities and impact investors to build the ecosystem in general. Coming to policy a little bit, uh, I would like to invite Shuin to you know share her experience about. Uh, dealing with policy uh, barriers from an investor side. So this is something that we have heard from multiple investors, uh, that policy can sometimes be difficult to navigate. Uh, so any thoughts on that, Shuin? Right. Um, you know, I, I guess like like any foreign investor, I mean, I think there's definitely things to, to navigate when, when investing um, in, in Vietnam for the first time, let's say. Um, I, I think the, the good thing for us, and I think, from, from many perspectives, this just makes a lot of sense, right? I mean, we do have a team on the ground, um, you know, apart from me, it's, it's all locals. Um, and I think having having been here for eight years, I think we know our, our way around the, the ropes. Um, but, but I would say that it is quite intimidating, right? As I talk to many different, um, you know, fund managers in, in the region, I think both from the impact side, as well as more mainstream commercial um, funds, I, mean, I think this is one of the big things in their mind, on their mind, right? In terms of, you know, how do I actually execute a deal into a local Vietnamese company and, you know, even if there is an exit event down the track, will I be able to get my, you know, the money out successfully, right? Which is perhaps the, the even more interesting question. Um, and I think it's, 
yeah, I would say it, it, it's not, um, you know, there's like many challenges, I think, along the way and different kind of bureaucratic hurdles, um, which, you know, which I think I would say have actually improved a lot or become easier over time. But I think there's still just a very large number of steps in terms of, you know, paperwork, notarized documents, opening a bank account, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that actually, um, you know, I think the timeframes for, for closing, you know, closing a deal, right, once you've already had it approved by your investment committee can easily stretch into like three to six months, right, um, just to actually get the investment kind of approvals and, and be able to invest into a company. So I think that is not necessarily specific to social enterprise or impact investing, but I think it's something that, that you know, over time, I think we would definitely um, hope, is, hope is kind of like streamlined further. And I think, you know, there's, there's already been some, some really helpful steps taken. I would say today it's much faster and easier than it was um, before. Um, but I think this is, you know, I think this is something on the minds of a lot of different investors. Um, I think the other thing, I mean, the other trend that I will have to admit we, we are seeing, right, is I think more companies are actually incorporating it in Singapore, right, or having a holding company in Singapore, um, which is the way um, around some of these different points. And, you know, I, I think I, I can see why that's happening just from a very practical perspective. Um, so I think these are some of the, uh, for me, I actually think it's, it's more like general kind of ease of doing business type of um, improvements that we would hope to see versus, you know, I mean, of course, there's more that can be done specifically for impact companies and impact investors. But I think just the general kind of, you know, ease of business uh, would be would be fantastic as, as kind of the first step, which which really lifts up all boats. <laughs> all right. All right. Thanks for that. Spin. And we have been getting some questions from the audience. And there is one particular question that I would like either you or land to answer. Uh, I think it fits well into some of the work that you have been doing. Uh, it's a question about uh, blended finance. And while uh, Beacon Fund, I assume, is giving, giving unsecured debt, what role do you see for, for blended finance for increasing the availability of such unsecured debt? And do you see that there is sufficient demand? Uh, uh, that's for Shuin. And Land, do you think there is something that needs to be done? What are some of the structures that can be put in place so that unsecured debt can be really channeled and can be enabled from a policy perspective? Uh, so uh, either of Lan or Shuin, would you like to answer that? I think maybe firstly, um, just a quick clarification. So at the Beacon Fund, um, it's it's not necessarily you know unsecured debt, but I think that the difference is a focus on securing against the company's assets versus personal assets. And I think um, you know I think that that in our minds is at least one one big difference. I mean I think typically, I mean as, as I think most of us on the call would know, um, you know I think the the local banks here would would you know would typically demand um, you know personal guarantee or some kind of your you know personal property um, as uh, as, as collateral. Um, I think the difference for the Beacon Funds, we're much more focused on the assets of the company. So it could be receivables, it could be um, inventory, machinery, equipment of the company, et cetera. Um, so which we feel is a kind of um, approach which is not that common in the market yet, um, the private credit market being, being pretty small as of, as of today. Um, I'm not sure um, that, you know, it, it's necessarily like, say, a policy change, um, which would need, I mean, I think firstly, I think, you know, lending or, or debt investment in, in Vietnam is, I think, a tightly regulated sector. So, so I think, um, and I, I actually don't see that's changing very quickly any anytime soon. Um, but I actually think in, in terms of increasing access of, say, debt capital in, in Vietnam, it's more around the growth of I see that as more being driven by the growth of the SME lending um, sector more generally, right? And increased focus amongst, um, you know, banks and like, you know, licensed financial institutions to increase access to capital um, there. And actually one of the interesting things here is that we've just invested in a company doing micro SME lending in, in, in Vietnam, which is, I think, you know, one of the largest platforms um, in the country for, for doing that. The, type, uh, the name of the company is called Kiman. And it basically provides, um, you know, small ticket lending of, you know, around, starting from $1,000, but, you know, then in increasing sizes from, from there on up. Um, and it does that by partnering with uh, Vietnamese banks and financial companies to actually um, deliver this type of financing to, you know, the, the small shops, you know, the millions of small enterprises, which are really the, the backbone of the ecosystem. So I think there's interesting models coming up, um, but, uh, you know, I think as it, but it is starting from a pretty low base, I would say, of, um, of, of the debt market. Got it. Thanks for that, Shuin. And Lan, before you before you weigh in on that, uh, there is one other question that you might want to weigh in on, is is about what do you think is the better approach for supporting the growth of the ecosystem? Do you think selecting a few impact enterprises that have great business models and help them scaling up is the way to go, or do you think that providing low touch support to a larger pool of enterprises 
uh, would be a better option. I believe UNDP has been doing a little bit of the latter in the past. So if you could weigh in on that, it will be very useful. Thanks, Amma. I couldn't hear the first question very well. Was it, uh, you said, uh, what can we do to encourage impact investors in terms of policy? Is that um, sort of the question? Yeah, so the earlier question that uh, Shuin weighed in, weighed in on was about how do you see uh, the role of uh, blended finance being as, as a tool to channel more capital with, with uh, uh, impact intent to enterprises? And do you think there is a role for policy in there? And what I asked just now is what would be a better way to approach uh, this problem is to providing, uh, providing support to a few select impact enterprises or providing low touch support to a larger pool of enterprises. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Um, okay, so so uh, I'll ask question in terms of policy side, uh, because I, I was working in policy for, for over six years, and, and it was also challenging on our part, because the way that the Vietnamese system makes policy is very much um, decentralized. Um, so so each ministry is in charge of one thing, and then they don't really talk to each other. Um, and for example, the uh, Ministry of Science and Technology was in charge of um, supporting startups, for example, and we were um, supposed to, to to build policies to support startups, but a lot of policies related to investment is under a Ministry of Planning, and Investment, a Ministry of Finance, or um, or the State Bank, for example. So in order to influence the the policy framework as a whole, we have to work with, with each individual people under the, the different ministries. Um, so I, I think in terms of what to do, um, it's, it's not as hard as how to do it in terms of policy. Um, I think for, for us, like people that sort of research a lot on policy to support startups uh, in general and also impact startup in, in, uh, in particular, we kind of know sort of the, 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 the policy menu. Um, but I think the, the important thing to do now is to raise awareness um, of this field to other uh, ministries that are sort of in charge of very, very important policy tools to attract um, impact uh, in investors uh, into Vietnam. So, uh, ministry of planning, investment, and ministry of finance, and such. Um, and, and I think the first thing is raising awareness, and that uh, has to do with um, constant and regular uh, dialogues uh, between investors uh, and, and stakeholders, um, impact stakeholders, with um, the government officials, both high level and also working level, because like a lot of them need to raise their awareness in order to actually uh, build policy to to attract uh, uh, impact investment. For the second question, uh, I think UNDP has done both, uh, both in terms of um, sort of challenges and competitions to support the most potential um, startups or, or projects, impact projects, uh, but we also uh, supporting in terms of uh, ecosystem building. Um, so, and, and, and when we talk with these uh, different stakeholders, uh, like incubators, accelerators, and whatnot, what they also recommend for, for UNDP to play a role is actually being a convener. Um, and, um, you know, have that platform for, for stakeholders to come together and, and, and dialogue, um, having dialogues on important issues and actually being sort of the intermediaries to raise the voices of all these like ecosystem stakeholders up to the government uh, and say, and, and request for policy changes. Um, so I think uh, both roles UDP has played, um, but uh, personally, I think we should play more of, of a second role uh, because of, you know, all this, toughness and complexity in, in the sort of policy making framework. And um, I think this is also what a lot of stakeholders have looked up to us, the UNP2, to, to play that role to, um, to talk to the government and, and have sort of more level play field uh, in terms of uh, policy making and policy advocacy. That's it. Got it, got it. Uh, thanks a lot for that, Lan. Uh, moving on to Dr. Thang, I think uh, further to what Lan said that there is a need to support a lot of investors, uh, sorry, a lot of social enterprises with low touch support. Do you see universities uh, playing a role in doing this? And I do believe that CSIE also does some mapping of social enterprises across Vietnam. So how do you see the landscape changing over time? And what are some of the insights from that mapping which can help design uh, interventions to support social enterprises? Yeah, thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, so so uh, CSAE, we we are you know like knowledge hub. So we have a digital digital uh, map of social enterprise in Vietnam, um, and um, uh, on the over six hundred um, uh, social enterprise on the map, uh, we see like um, uh, the, the the focus is still in the big cities in Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh City, 
where uh, they are more in Hanoi because it's where the embassies, you know, um, the, the donors are there uh, in terms of numbers. Uh, but in terms of businesses still in Ho Chi Minh City as an economic hub, uh, um, the, uh, actually the real um, organizations of social enterprise, they may, be, they, they may stay in you know, rural areas, but actually they are not aware that they are social enterprise themselves. Uh, so they do not you know, claim to, to be on the map. Um, but um, I see, um, uh, because uh, as a CSIE and UDP, we create, uh, we have, we, 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 we co-created the uh, Impact um, Tech Fest, uh, which is within the, one, of the, one of the main pillars in the Tech Fest, the showcase of, of technology startup in Vietnam every year, uh, normally attended and, and supported by the ministers of the country. So uh, since 20, uh, 2018, at the moment that we introduced the impact uh, technology, you know, impact startup as a concept, it seems, you know, it's, there's nobody know and aware of the concept. And this year we see a big changing of awareness all around the, uh, all around the country. Uh, recently, we got um, the, the Ho Chi Minh City, the economic hub uh, of the country. They, uh, because the, the periods of 2020 and 2025 is a five years planning of the, the entire country. Uh, and each of the provinces and cities, they also have their own planning. Uh, planning. So the Ho Chi Minh City, they, they put social enterprise and impact setup as one of the priorities of economic uh, development of the city. And another uh, province, which is also uh, in the other side of, this, uh, of the country, they also uh, put um, impact setup as, as the priorities. And one of the good news is uh, by the end of 25 of September this year, the, the, the prime ministers, the government just issue one degree that um, about the, the strategies of uh, to reach um, uh, SDGs for the for the the entire uh, country, and um, for the first time, the prime minister divide, uh, you know, give directions to each of the ministries and provinces what they need to do to 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 reach SDGs, uh, you know, or, or solve uh, uh, social issues in the next five years. Uh, so, um, as you know, like startup is one of, of the the priorities of the country uh, of, of, the, of the government. Uh, since 20, uh, 2016 up to now. And in fact, setup uh, for us, um, we, we have been able somewhat to convince uh, the agendas uh, of, of the government, like in fact, setup is a way that we use the innovations, uh, with, you know, um, uh, technology-based uh, setup to reach SDGs. So it's, it's really a, a sustainable uh, business model. So yeah, this is really a good news and, and we are very, very proud. Uh, from UNDP and uh, CSIE uh, viewpoint of the re result of uh, what uh, what provinces and the government are doing now. Yeah. Got it, got it. Thanks for that, uh, Dr. Thang. Uh, coming to Andrew a little bit to understand, you did mention the role of uh, the pandemic of COVID-19 on, on the ecosystem and Shuin also mentioned about how uh, we need to ensure that Investing in women is not just, or rather, gender lens investing is not just investing in women-owned enterprises. However, it is known that women uh, are disproportionately affected by the pandemic. So, any thoughts on how you see a change in strategy moving forward for investing in women and focusing uh, on the wider uh, definition of gender lens investing, including the focus on women entrepreneurs uh, in particular? Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Amara. I guess the um, obviously, you know, with COVID nineteen, uh, different companies affected in different ways, but um, major disruption, the precipitous fall in revenues and profit margins, and just the general um, impacts on otherwise viable businesses who are now sort of, um, you know, who may have underlying strong business fundamentals, but um, yeah, suffering through this this time. So, um, the I guess what we did see with um, investing in women was um, the need to move both in the short term and the medium term. So, uh, we did establish a responsive interventions supporting entrepreneurs fund, Rise. I think there's a few Rise funds out there, but. Um, and this was um, channeled through our existing impact investing partners, but looking to um, 
to support, I guess, the first stage, the emergency relief to to mitigate those sort of short term liquidity constraints for those those businesses who are otherwise uh, functioning well. Um, and but I think important also to think of the longer term, the resilience. And it is, you know, we're going to be uh, in different countries. We'll be going in and out of lockdown over different times. I mean, I think uh, Vietnam, a big plus for Vietnam is the way that it has handled um, COVID to date. Um, and interesting as we look across the, the countries in the uh, investing in women portfolio, um, yeah, Vietnam's definitely uh, done the best, but you can also see that people were going into and coming out of lockdown and uh, you know, that will be different challenges for different businesses. It will give opportunities for some, you know, particularly on the tech side, getting people onto those online platforms and so on. But um, yeah, so the second stage, we have set up a, a resilience facility for uh, to support promising women's SMEs who are emerging in the economic recovery um, over the longer term, so six to 24 months. And so this is looking to complement rather than duplicate sort of other mechanisms that are um, in, uh, coming on through other institutions. Um, we know also, uh, I think it was, yeah, obviously the, uh, you know, we were hearing from our investing partners that the emergency needs, um, you know, we had to act quickly, I guess, for those um, for those early partners. And I think, um, yeah, I can see Shu Yen nodding, nodding there. I know that was a case there. Um, but I know that uh, others have been setting up um, these partnerships as well, and I think CIF, I think the colleagues from CIF are on the uh, around the table today as well as um, just announced a kind of resilience fund as well for for supporting women's SMEs who are coming through um, coming through these times. So it is um, it's yeah I, it will be um, one thing which is useful for the research as I mentioned the the research which you presented Amar is that. Um, because it was looking through to the end of um, 2019, that will provide a very interesting um, baseline for the next for the next update. And at that stage, we'll really get a sense of how COVID has unfolded and what what the impacts have been over time. So I'm looking forward to reading your report in three years' time, Anna. All right, thanks for that, Andrew. Uh, and you did mention, uh, you know, how global capital will likely get get reallocated and you mentioned Chief. So incidentally, we have Chief in the in the audience today. So Ravina, if you want to say something, I'll, I'll come back to you in a minute. But in the meanwhile, given that global capital will likely get reallocated, and this is a question for Shuen, uh, how do you think local capital can be unlocked uh, to be channeled into impact investing uh, if, if uh, DFI capital is going to indeed be reallocated? So how do we keep in, impact investment in Vietnam going? I would say as far as DFI, I think, yes, definitely COVID has changed our global capital allocation. But I think as far as DFIs are concerned, I would say that in general, we've been really encouraged by, by the response, right, uh, of, of DFIs, um, you know, all DFIs, um, in terms of, you know, speedily moving capital towards um, COVID uh, response and recovery. Um, and, and I think, you know, particularly with a gender lens, right? I mean, during this time, uh, I think many of you, may have seen uh, the 2x commitment was actually doubled, right, from $3 billion to $6 billion and in, in the midst of, of COVID. So, so I would actually say that um, some of the response has been, I mean, quite, quite encouraging and positive. And I think uh, in some ways COVID made us realize that, I mean, you know, we, we still, we need to redouble our commitment, right, towards, um, towards you know, towards gender, um, given the disproportionate uh, effect of, of COVID on, on women. Um, and and remain committed, right? And also kind of look at ways to move more, more quickly, right? As, as Andrew was, was mentioning before. Um, at the same time though, I, I, I definitely agree with you that, you know, mobilizing local capital is an important goal that, um, you know, I think that uh, impact investors have been working on for, um, for, for a long time. Um, I think a big focus for us is mobilizing, say, local family offices and, and local sources of capital towards, um, you know, towards impact investing, um, you know, whether through funds or, or directly. Um, honestly, I think simulating the retail market might take a longer period of time for, for a whole variety of different reasons. But I think the first step 
is really encouraging more engagement um, by, uh, by by local family offices, foundations, corporates um, into um, into impact investing in different ways. And I think we do see early signs that that is that is occurring. Uh, we been made aware that we are almost at the end of time. So before we close, I would like to you know quickly uh, uh, request Rowena, uh, audience, uh, Rowena, if you would like to say something, uh, we would gladly hear from you. Um, Omar, can you repeat Omar, that? Omar, we didn't uh, quite catch you. Uh, yeah. Your volume was a little low. Okay. So when I think Omar was saying that if you have anything to say, you could uh, go ahead and uh, uh, give us your feedback. Uh, yes, thank you for, for giving us the, the time. Um, when COVID hit our portfolio companies, we Im immediately uh, went into action in helping them um, navigate the, the implications. In the process, we, we thought that it was necessary to actually have a, a COVID facility that would address their, their needs, not, not just in the immediate term, but more on the longer term. That's why we uh, collaborated with a uh, DFC in, in coming up with the COVID-19 facility. And also, we are also uh, having, uh, we have the access to the resilience facility of um, investing in women. So we are both using um, the facilities in order to aid not just the portfolio companies, but other um, SMEs in, in the region and uh, on a global basis. Um, I think we are almost at the end of time, so I would like to uh, invite Prachi uh, from IW to come in and draw her part. Thanks, Amar. I'm delighted to have this opportunity to say a few words to close the session. Uh, it's really encouraged to uh, hear all the speakers and uh, uh, the New, the actions they have taken to respond to COVID-19, the new commitments which have come through from DFIs and local philanthropic organizations in the region to support both impact investing and gentle lens investing. Uh, as we all know, the single most important opportunity pre-COVID-19 was to unlock the potential of women and girls. And as for the latest research which you shared, uh, we have seen continuous increase uh, over the last three years. And we all recognize here in the room that we face a significant risk that COVID-19 could unlock, uh, can undo many of these gains and worsen the existing gender inequalities around the world. So I have a couple of suggestions here for concrete action for all of us. One, we need to allocate capital with gender lens. We know that the national emergency response and post-COVID recovery measures need to embed gender equality at their core, and that's not really happening. For example, we have an opportunity to integrate gender lens in the huge financing packages by government and leading organizations such as World Bank Group and ADB, who can mandate investments into, MSM, into women-led MSMEs in the region. Similarly, private capital providers in the room have the capacity to respond rapidly and flexibly. And we have seen several examples from Sif and Patamar and others in the region who are doing a great work in the region to that end. Second, we can invest in female leaders. So we have seen that the response of women political leaders is being lauded during COVID-19, but there is very little attention being given to gender diversity in COVID response and recovery, be it the recovery task force at the country level or business leadership and governance leadership. So there is an opportunity to reconceive leadership and to include women more fully, acknowledging their contributions and building inclusive and resilient economies. Last but not the least, capital providers and shareholders have clout to demand the change. All of us as either part of governments, DFIs or investors can use our power on boards and as shareholders to encourage adoption of gender smart policies among their investees. With this, I wish Sankal team well for your first virtual conference and I look forward to engaging with all of you during the course of this event. Thank you. Yeah, thanks Prachi. Thank you very much for that. Um, that brings us to the end of this panel. We still have five minutes left. So I'm quickly going to come back to uh, all our panelists to make some closing remarks. Uh, 
Lan, would you like to start? Would you like to say something? Yes, uh, thank you so much. I, uh, for me personally, I think this is great in terms of uh, having the dialogue uh, among different stakeholders in the ecosystem in terms of impact investment and also um, general lens uh, investment. Um, and this is a new thing for, for the country. And, and uh, based on your research, you know, so all the speakers have um, already spoken. It's an important direction, but also very new. So um, we would uh, love to be in this ecosystem and also um, provide our own resources uh, and also platforms to convene people. Um, and uh, we will play this role in terms of uh, being an intermediary uh, to support people to raise their voices and connect up to the government uh, for relevant policy changes. Um, so, so it's great that there's a platform like, like this um, forum um, and we'd love to, to, to do more um, and uh, connect with people like IntelliCap and also other stakeholders to do more research in, in the field um, and, and raise relevant policy. Thank you. Thanks for that, Lan. Thanks for being on the panel and your support during the research. Uh, Dr. Thang, uh, would you like to say something? Yes. So actually, as, a, as what, uh, what I said before, uh, since uh, this year, it's, um, you know, impact investment could be um, quite promising here in Vietnam because of the priorities of the government really put uh, uh, SDGs and, and startup, tech-based tech startup as a, uh, in the agenda. Uh, and um, just to just to inform in marketing a little bit is by the, uh, by mid of 20, uh, 2021 next year, um, uh, with the Ministry of uh, Science Technology, uh, we're organizing the uh, Vietnam uh, Impact Investment uh, Forum uh, 2021. So we will love, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's really a forum uh, for, for, for impact uh, startup here in Vietnam to expose to international um, impact investors. And uh, we really love to, uh, to have the um, participations um, and uh, show interest, express interest from impact investors uh, all, all around the world uh, to join uh, this, uh, this forum. So welcome to Vietnam next year. Thanks for that, Dr. Thang. Uh, Shuin, any last comments? Right. Um, I think maybe just commenting specifically on on GLI, right, uh, which uh, you know is the area near and dear to my heart. I think um, my my comment or kind of suggestion there is 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 to you know to, to really get started. Um, I, I think you know GLI sometimes can seem like quite a theoretical concept or maybe something that will take a lot of work to implement or something that you know requires a very complex strategy. But I think the the reality is you know I, I think. You know, I would really encourage all organizations, right, whether they're entrepreneurs or coming more from the investor side or more from an intermediary perspective, to really begin by looking at, you know, by collecting and looking at your gender disaggregated data, right, and looking at the ways um, in which, you know, you are supporting either, you know, whether it's female entrepreneurs, right, or the customers and suppliers of those entrepreneurs, um, or whether, you know, or looking at the way that you have um, formed your own team. I think by beginning with that gender disaggregated data and then looking for insights um, and, and seeing how you can run a better business or investment firm, right? I think that really was the, the impetus for us going in our gender lens investing journey. And, and I think my, my final thought is, is, you know, would really encourage others to, to do the same. All right, thanks. Thank you very much for that, Shuin. And thank you for all the panelists for, for your time today. And a special thank you to CSIP who have been instrumental in supporting this, this research that we have been doing in Vietnam. Uh, that brings us to the end of this session. Uh, Uncle is still on for the next four days. So I hope all of you stick around our, and are able to attend many more meaningful sessions. Thank you once again for, for your time and see you at Sankalp.